amen. It is so good to see you all here today. It has been a lovely week. It has been a busy week. It has been a week full of blessings for all of us, for all of you, hopefully, and most importantly, for all of you young people who are here today, the younger generation. We are glad that you all are here. You are valued. You are appreciated. You are a part of this church, and this worship is as much yours as it is any adult here, and I want you all to know that. Today, our topic is going to be on loving your children. Now, for some of you, you might be scratching my head. It's like, what do you mean I don't love my children? Of course you love your children. But do you love other people's children? <laughs> do you love other people's children? <laughs> our youth director, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Of course we love other people's children. We love all the children who are in this church. We exist to love. We exist to love one another. We exist to love the community. We exist to love inside the church and outside the church, regardless of age, regardless of race, regardless of nationality, regardless of, regardless of language, regardless of gender. We exist as a church to love. So we're going to talk a little bit today about what it means to love your children. What is the biblical perspective? And if we're going to really dive into this, we have to have a discussion about family. What does family mean? Now, in the United States, we have the concept of the nuclear family. Chances are you guys have heard about the nuclear family before. It really came to prominence and popularity in the 20th century, beginning about the end of World War II. This idea that the family was a close-knit unit. It was within your house, your, your spouse, and your children, uh, maybe grandparents and grandchildren. But by and large, the nuclear family became this idea, this cultural concept that became very, very popular in the United States in which you looked at your family as the people who are living within your home. That was the concept of the nuclear family. Now, there's positives and there's negatives to this. The positives to this were obvious. You could have an influence over your family for whatever your beliefs and values were culturally. You were the king and queen of your castle, if you will. And it was a way in which you could kind of, quote, unquote, protect those who are within your house from any threats that might be outside of it. There's a reason why homes became kind of culturally, colloquially known in some way, shape, or form as castles. But the negatives to this are also apparent. A disconnect from the community. A disconnect from the people who live to the left and the right of you. A disconnect from others. And in some ways, we are kind of seeing the long-term ramifications of that. People are very, very, very insular, oftentimes very isolated. They see themselves in the world as kind of an us versus them mentality, and unfortunately, that has gone into the church as well. Sometimes the church has an us versus them mentality. This is our nuclear family. Beware of what goes on outside of these walls. But brothers and sisters, that, that is an American cultural phenomena. And it's actually kind of a bizarre thing that has taken place because for the vast majority of human history, that was not the case. And that was certainly not the understanding of family that we see in the pages of Scripture, that we see in the Old Testament and New Testament, that we see in the context of the ancient Near East and beyond. For centuries and millennia, family had a much wider connotation. So I want to share with you a little bit, kind of a simplified, streamlined version of the biblical understanding of the family unit. First and foremost, you had what the Bible often translates as your people. People. Now, for us, in our context, what we would see as people if we were looking at it through biblical eyes as America, your national identity. 
So for the people of the Bible, they would see Israel as their people, Israel as a whole, regardless of what tribe you come from. If you are part of Israel, you are my people. You are a part of my family, the people of God. So if we were to look at the United States through biblical eyes, we would see every American, everyone who is living here, regardless of where they come from, regardless of their original nationality, regardless of their ethnicity or what language they speak, as part of a family. Then you would have your tribe, right? You had the various tribes, Judah, Benjamin, Levi, so on and so forth, the tribes of Israel, Well, for all intents and purposes, the greatest contextualization of that in the world in which we see today would be your ethnic identity. People identify themselves as African American, or Asian American, or Pacific Island American, or whatever, or what have have you, South American American, I mean, you know, European American, your ethnic identity, where where it is you you hail from uh, in somewhat of a... uh, in today's day and age, that would be somewhat in a, in a genetic sense, but there's also a, uh, there's also a geographical context to it. Well, that certainly existed back then. They had their tribal identity. In fact, sometimes the tribes would even butt heads and have conflict amongst each other. They would have different priorities, different prerogatives. But despite the fact that you had this ethnic differentiation amongst the various tribes, they were still considered part of the family. The tribe of Levi considered the tribe of Judah part of the family, and so on and so forth. Then you would have your clan. You would have these subgroups within these tribal units, your clan of people. And oftentimes, there was a a very strong uh, kind of familial relationship there. And you see this example time and time again, particularly in the Old Testament. Uh, You have examples of people from the various clans coming up and bringing their case before Moses or whoever the case may be, you have the example of there was a, uh, there was a clan in which all the, all the men were essentially gone. There was only the women left of this, this tight-knit sort of familial unit. And they said, do we not deserve an inheritance? How do we keep our clan going? All the men are dead. And the Lord said, yeah, absolutely. Honor them. Honor their clan. Honor their inheritance. Don't forget, they're part of your family. And finally, you get down to what we see as the family in our modern-day 21st century American context, and we've kind of made it the end-all, be-all. The bottom of the totem pole, if you will, was your father's house, where you live, the people who are actually in the home with you, your immediate family. You have kind of this contextualization I gave for you all, this Jones family from Louisville, Kentucky. I think it's your father's house. You're looking at it through biblical eyes. But the point is, what we're trying to say here is that if we are going to start being serious about the way in which we reach our children, about the way in which we reach the community, about the way in which we reach the various generations, that we need to stop looking at family through American cultural eyes as just the people who are living in your house and start seeing everyone here who is in this church as part of a family and everyone out there as well, regardless of whether we agree or disagree with them as part of a family. God came down and died for us so that we can all, as a race, be a part of the family of God. Those who are not in the kingdom of heaven, it's not because they're not a part of the family of God, it's because they say, I don't want to be a part of the family. Because they say, I, I, I want to divorce myself from that family. They don't, they don't want to be a part of it. But God looks at every man, woman, and child, and he says, you are my children, and I love you. Can't we look at other people the way God looks at them, the way God looks at us, the way God looks at me? If God looks at me and says, I love you, you're a child of God, that doesn't just apply to me. It applies to all of you. It applies to all of those people out there too. In Proverbs 27.10, we have a beautiful example of the way in which God's people were intended to look at one another. It says, do not forsake your friend and your father's friend, and do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. How many of you feel comfortable going to your neighbor where you live 
when you're going through a hard time. How many of you even know your neighbors that well? Hey, I struggle with this. I am naturally an introverted person, believe it or not. (laughs) Some of you laugh. Thank you. I appreciate that. (laughs) It shows that I've been making progress. I am naturally a homebody. I am naturally an introverted person. I've got a ring on my door so that I can see who's at the door without me ever having to get up from the couch. I go around locking the doors at night. It is difficult for me, but praise God, he's working on me because I actually have a neighbor in my neighborhood right now, really great guy who is going out of his way to try and become friends with me. And God forgive me, I'm making it difficult for him. But, <laughs> but I'm trying because when we see other people out there as family, then we feel a sense of obligation to them and they to us. And that is not an unhealthy thing. Now, we have shades of this, shadows of this that are still in existence within the church, within the church organizational structure, within the way we do things. And I want to talk about this particularly in the context of the younger generation, the young people of this church. We have youth ministry, we have Pathfinder, we have VBS, we have children's story, etc. All of these things are intended to convey this beautiful, biblical, godly idea that all of you children are not not just the children of your parents, but that you are the church's children, that you are God's children, that you are our children, and that we love you. But as I said, these are just, these are shadows, these are echoes, because we still have this this difficult time really, really making this a reality, really, really making this a culture, really making this something that is manifested in the way in which we do church. So I'm going to talk to you this morning and give you guys five axioms, five principles by which I believe we can start really getting serious about discipling the younger generation. Ways in which we can really start looking at the younger generation differently how we can be impactful with them. So the first principle is this. Parents and church leaders must acknowledge that culture plays a formative role in the lives of the young people. Culture plays a formative role in the lives of the young people. And when I say culture, I don't just mean church culture, I mean community culture. Is there a culture of Louisville? Absolutely. I know there's a culture of Louisville because people look at me strangely every time I say Louisville. (laughs) There is a culture here that's formative in your young people's lives. It matters. There's other elements of culture, some that are seen, some that are unseen, some that are abstract. Some, is, some of it is clothing, the way in which you dress, the way in which you walk, the way in which you talk. Culture plays a part in that, the way in which you do things, the words in which you use, the phrases, everything, even the devices that we use are part of culture. Internet is part of culture. There is a hunger for it. People long to be a part of something. It's natural. It is hard written into our DNA. It's how we were created. God wanted us for culture. He intended us for godly culture. It's unfortunate that sin entered the world. But you can't ignore this. It must be an acknowledgement that the world out there is formative in your children's life. Don't be afraid of culture. Number two, culture cannot be avoided through homeschool or private school. It cannot be avoided through homeschool or private school. Now, I'm in favor of private school. I went through private school. Private school is a good thing. This isn't knocking private school or homeschool. They are wonderful things. They are awesome opportunities. I had a very positive education going through the Adventist system. It really prepared me for adulthood and for collegiate life and collegiate studies. Homeschool is the same thing. I have met homeschoolers that were better prepared for adulthood than most public school kids and most even private education kids. I've also met homeschoolers that were weird as a $3 bill. 
but I charitably chalk that more up to genetics than anything else. If you're sending your children to private school or if you're homeschooling your children hoping to isolate them from culture, good luck. Good luck. What is your plan? To lock them up in the basement when they turn 18? Yeah, it won't work. Embrace culture. Look at it through the biblical lens. Look at it through the lens of a Christian. Teach your children how to parse culture, how to interpret culture, how to understand culture. Don't hide from it. Don't let it scare you. Go into it armed with the gospel. Number three, and this is incredibly important, brothers and sisters, culture is not inherently evil or sinful and should not be viewed as something to be cleansed from Christian life. That is incredibly important, incredibly so. I'll give you two examples. I'll give you a modern-day one. I'll give you a biblical one. So, culture for all intents and purposes, is amoral. Not immoral, amoral. The absence of morality. Now, it is true that culture can be used for good or for evil. People can use culture as a springboard to do wrong in the world, to do evil, to serve the purposes of darkness in this world, but they can also use culture as a springboard for good, to do things that are godly in the world, and to share the wonderful gospel message. Think of the story of Joseph. And chances are you guys know this story. A young man who his own brothers grabbed him and sold him into slavery. And later on in his life, when Joseph had the opportunity to confront his brothers on what they had done, what did Joseph say? What you intended for evil, God used for good. And as a modern day example, let's talk about Christmas for just a moment. We had some nice Christmas music this morning, didn't we? That's okay, we're celebrating Christmas in July. Christmas has been a source of tension in this denomination for decades. I not only celebrate Christmas, I encourage Christians to celebrate Christmas. And here's the reason why I do that. What kind of message does it send when someone says, we don't celebrate Christmas because of its pagan roots? It sends the message that if Satan has intended something for evil, God's not strong enough to touch it. I celebrate Christmas because I believe in the God who says, you intended that for evil, but I've taken it and I'm now using it for good. I'm now using it to spread the gospel message. However, Christi however Christmas may have started, Christianity has taken it, and it is now ours in order to do the work of the gospel message and to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And I praise God for that. Culture is not inherently evil or sinful, brothers and sisters. And your children need to know that. Number four, awareness of generational trends and priorities is not compromising the church. Be aware of what matters to the younger generation. Internet matters to the younger generation. You know why? Because we talked about that hard written part of our DNA that longs for that cultural identity, that longs for that family, that longs to be beyond the walls of your house. And the younger generation is actually doing that, but they're doing it through the internet. They're connecting with people all across the nation, all across their state, all across the world, people have a hunger to be a part of a family, to be a part of a unit. We need to be aware of that. And we need to equip our young people to when they go into that situation, to when they go into that medium, to when they begin expressing themselves in the way that matters, in the priorities, in the trends of their generation, they are doing so as Christians. 
And that means that we have to talk about these things. That means that we have to prepare our children. That means that we don't shut our children into a corner and say, don't look over there, there's bad stuff over there. It means we say, look at it as a Christian. Be prepared. Prepare your children for the realities of the world in which they live in. Prepare your children for the 21st century. Prepare your children to be warriors for the Lord Jesus Christ in their cultural context. And finally, number five, and this is so important, so important. Family discipleship in the church is not intended to ostracize young people from non-believing families. Rather, it is to equip young people to be a part of enfolding non-Christians into the family of God. When we look at the younger generation, when we look at our young people, when we get serious about discipleship, it's not about just them. It's about the people out there too. Because like all of us, we may be a little bit older, but God has set the children apart too. God has set the children apart for his use, for his work, for sharing the gospel message. God has a mission in this community. He wants you to be a part of it, and he wants your children to be a part of it as well. He wants your children to be a part of it. Children are not just programs. They're part of the Christian movement. These are five principles, five axioms by which we can start taking a hard look at the discipleship of the young generation and getting serious about it. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 through 3 says, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. Let's not put obstacles in the way of our children as they develop a relationship with Jesus Christ, as they question, as they search, and as they seek to be a part of something that is so much bigger than themselves, so much bigger than Pastor Chris, so much bigger than any of you, something that is worldwide, that is global, that is intended to shine the wonderful love of Jesus Christ into the hearts and minds of every human being who would receive it. Brothers and sisters, a church that is effectively discipling the next generation is fueled by love rather than behavior. Amen. Is fueled by love rather than behavior. If the church and the home suppress the realities of culture, then when the younger generation graduates from high school, they also graduate from church. I went to a Seventh-day Adventist university for my undergrad and my master's. You have no idea how many people I talked to who said, I'm only here because my parents told me they wouldn't pay for my education unless I went here. And as soon as I graduate, I'm gone. It's no myth that we are struggling to be relevant to the younger generation. And many of you, my own family included, can probably resonate with this message that a young person, someone who they love, someone who's part of their family, when they were done with high school, they were also done with church because there wasn't anyone there to make them go anymore. Brothers and sisters, the church must be willing, must be willing, to meet the younger generation where they are rather than where we want them to be. And that applies not just to the younger generation, that applies to the whole community. We must be willing to meet people where they are with the gospel message rather than where we want them to be. If our church culture is not willing to do that, if we stand still on principles, if we stand still and rigid on principles rather than move in love with the gospel, then congratulations, brothers and sisters, we will have the holiest nursing home in all of Louisville. 
2 Corinthians 3, verse 4 through 6 says, Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God alone who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Praise God. Brothers and sisters, we have been called to love, to love our children, to love this family, not just the family that is in your home, not just the family that was in the walls of this church, but the entire family of God. God sees every single person outside of these walls and says, that is my child. I love them and I want them to be in the kingdom of heaven. Can't we say the same? Brothers and sisters, love your children. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. When you love your children, don't just love the children in your home. Love all God's children. Amen.